Welcome back to A Fresh Story, the podcast where we have conversations about brave decisions to start over again. I'm Olivia. And I'm Jenny. And we're so glad you're here today. Hello, hello, Sister Pooh. What's going on? Sister Pooh. So we went from Sister Pooh Robin right to Sister Pooh. The the formation of a nickname is very important. Yeah, we'll get into that in another episode. <laughs> um, I, every, I don't know what's going on. I'm eating a granola bar from Southdown. And Not I just was, any granola bar. I was heavily influenced. Like I saw it on their stories and I literally said yesterday, hey, let's go get those. <laughs> and I'd never <laughs> had one before because they don't they don't look particularly interesting, but they're like one of those like energy balls, but there it's like a whole bar of it. It's like oh, so good. oats, peanut butter, chocolate chips, and it's vegan. And so it means I can mm-hmm. eat it. Dates, um, agave or maple syrup, maybe it's really good. So I've been like, but they're really big and dense, which is great. Um, anyway, we we're South End stands. South End, whenever you want to start sponsoring this podcast, we're ready. Shout out to South End. Shout, shout out to South End. Um we talked this episode was great oh such a good episode. very special for olivia yeah so this episode was with gabrielle stone who is a beautiful wonderful amazing human and um you know so much of life is like these breadcrumbs like these like things that are like left in your way and you yeah. don't know how they're going to like impact you later and so when i was going through my separation and for anybody that doesn't know you, you often go through a deep depression the the divorce depression like tm that you go through um you know some of my friends who didn't really know what to do or how to support me would send me things and one of the books they sent me was eat pray fml which i thought was hysterical because we all love liz gilbert but like this was like a real like cheeky take on it and like that is how you feel when you're going through it like fuck my life and so it was by this woman gabrielle stone and i loved it it was on my bedside table i get multiple copies um and lo and behold years later we got the chance to sit down and have a conversation with her about her journey and the book and how it all came together. Uh, and it was just amazing. I think the most, I mean, the most interesting part was the story and her story is fascinating. Yeah. I recommend everybody read the book and follow her on TikTok because she makes great And there's TikTok a second videos. book, yeah. Yeah, but the other interesting part that I took away was she self-published. And I, you know, I maybe I'm a little bit of a, of a Luddite when it comes to this, but like, I didn't realize that you could be so popular when you self-publish. I mean, she's she, well. She talks she about it on the I, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, she talks about it on the episode, and it was, you know, again, we love the business behind things, mm-hmm. and she is a businesswoman at heart. Yeah. Um, and and again, is so much in the Fresh Starts ethos, where she took a broken heart and turned yeah. it into a platform 100%. for empowerment. But you know, Olivia and I are working on some projects, super projects that we're very yeah. excited about. Um. And learning about the self-publication versus, um, you know, traditional traditional publication methods. Big five, the big five. The big, yeah. yeah, the big five and getting a publishing house and everything like that. Learning about the benefits um, was what I needed to hear that night. And I think mm-hmm. I said that to her. Maybe I said it after the podcast was over, but it was what I needed to hear that night. And um, she was really encouraging and really lovely and really generous with her story and her time yeah Um, her vulnerability yeah yeah and she has some exciting things coming up she's getting married again in march i know it's so exciting and we always you know we love love here like we love love i was just thinking about that you know i was thinking about like nobody i mean okay maybe the nobody but like (laughs) i i think divorced people love love more than so more than people realize yeah. and i think she was like a perfect testament to that like yeah. we love so deeply and she healed so in so well like you know her story is just beautiful and yeah. her, and she said yes you know she took the risk mm-hmm. on herself and mm-hmm. i just love that so enjoy our conversation with gabrielle stone please remember to rate review and subscribe to her fresh story so we can keep telling fresh start stories Gabrielle Stone is no stranger to the world of entertainment and the idea of a fresh start in life. Growing up on the set with her legendary scream queen mother, Dee Wallace, she had days of licking off mommy's fake blood and watching behind the scenes movie magic. Seeing the world with mom and dad gave her the travel bug at an early age until Gabrielle experienced a real life horror when she lost her father suddenly at age seven. 
After many years in the industry herself, Stone transitioned from meaty acting roles to writing and directing her award-winning films. It happened again last night and after Emma gained her awards for writing, directing, and acting. But she had a bigger role in life that she would soon present itself. Freaking badass. After the rug was pulled out from her when her husband's affair came to light, she found herself falling into the arms of another man. After a second failed attempt at love and a massive heartbreak, she decided that instead of landing flat on her ass, she'd make a career out of it, which we love. And so came the birth of her book, Eat, Pray, FML, where she shared all of the mistakes, all the lessons, and most importantly, how she became a fearless leader from it all. When fans around the world demanded more, the highly anticipated sequel, The Ridiculous Misadventures of a Single Girl, and the podcast FML Talk were born. And Gabrielle soon realized that her broken heart had bloomed a movement, which we are all about here at Fresh Starts. I love what she says on her website. It says, and this like cracks me up. A wise woman once said, fuck that shit and lived happily ever after. <laughs> and we are all about that. Um, and I just want to say, so your book came out in June 2019, I was currently living in the house with my ex-husband and my two kids before he moved out. We were living in for three months. We lived together in the house. Yeah. It was truly eat, pray, FML every single day. I had multiple friends send me your book. I literally, my <laughs> bedside table was like, your book, your book, your book, your book. And I was like, oh my God, like I love saint. it. I was like, she, <laughs> because you know what, back then, and even this wasn't that long ago, right? We weren't talking about divorce. We weren't talking about this hard shit. And I felt so alone and scared. And just knowing that somebody else was writing about this was yeah. truly inspiring. So I'm really honored to have you here tonight sharing your story with us. Thank you for being here. Oh my God. I love that so much. And I'm so glad that it was some type of anchor and <sighs> hope in such a shitty time. I oh. cannot imagine having to be cohabitating with someone you're getting a divorce from for that long. <laughs> no, um, it was uh, not fun. I, <laughs> I would not wish that on my worst enemy, but I'm so glad that everybody was smart enough to send they you did. my book. I'm glad that it helped. Um, Cause yeah, you're right. When, when I first, you know, discovered the affair and, and realized I was getting divorced, there was a lot of shame around it. And it mm -hmm. was, it was embarrassing. And it was, I didn't want people to know. And like, I'm a failure. Yeah. And now I really look back at my divorce and I'm like, I'm a badass, like good for me for choosing myself. Like, yeah. I, I hope that women don't see that as the end, but see it as your chance for a beautiful new beginning. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Um, we're so excited to have you here. Let's start with my first question, which is how are you tonight? I'm so good guys. I'm so good. Yeah, we life well, you have a lot of things. I was just looking at your beautiful Instagram feed and you have, your life is beautiful. <laughs> I want to hear all about it. I want to get into it. Yeah, so it's, so, it's it's so funny because I I really try hard to keep my Instagram authentic. Um, I think there's so much bullshit out there. Yeah. People mm -hmm. just being yeah. like, "Look at my beautiful life." Um, so there are times where I'm like, I'm fucking depressed and like mm -hmm. shit's tough right now. But right now, life is pretty good. So that's, that's what you're that's seeing great. on my on my page. <laughs> it can be authentically good too. Yes, you know, yes. and that, that's we important that. to show people like authentic yeah. joy. Why don't you take us back to the beginning of your fresh starts story? Oh my God. Okay. So I got married in 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, this was like the guy that everybody was like, Oh my God, she's finally found mm -hmm. someone. She doesn't have to fix someone that's going to be her equal, someone that wants to take care of her. Mm -hmm. Um, it, everybody was really like, Oh wow. Like finally. Um, and it was interesting because from the get go, he had a problem with my career at the time I was working just as an actress. That was my dream. Um, and I was just able to fully support myself without like a side job or a day mm -hmm. job, which is huge. You know, yeah. like mm -hmm. everyone yes. that's acting has like three jobs because yeah. it's such a cutthroat industry. You're constantly like book a job, book a job. So you can like get a paycheck. Yep. It's, it's tough. So I, I was at a place in my career where I was really proud of myself that I was at least like getting by without having that, that day job. And I was starting to get roles that, um, were a little bigger with, you know, bigger budget films. Um, and it was a really exciting time for me as an actress, like seeing that trajectory start to change. And he had a problem with it from the beginning. He was really jealous. Um, I mean, if I had a kissing scene in a film I was doing, forget about it. Mm. Like it was like hell to pay when I got home and called him after set, like, 
just like very, very controlling. Um, didn't want me to go out with my co-stars if there were guys there uh, for dinner, like very obvious. Um, and mm-hmm. I, I saw that I recognized the red flag, but was like, Oh, you know, we'll go to therapy. We'll work through it. It's not the easiest job to like, right. Have yeah. your significant other do like, I, I was understanding of that, but like he met me as an actress. It wasn't like, <laughs> Right. You know, I work, at the, I work at the grocery store. Just kidding. I'm going to go do films right. now. You know, now, like I, have he... a, I have a question for you because we talk a lot about coercive control and control and emotional abuse and all that stuff. Yeah. Was it outwardly like telling you, like, I don't like this? Like he was like saying that or was it more like the kind of like the grumble, passive aggressive, subtle? Um, it, it wasn't subtle, but it was <laughs> it was very manipulative. So it would be. Um, I would come home, for example, from a day on set, if I was on location. So like if I was out of town and he was back home and I would try and like tell him about my day and the conversation would turn into a screaming, yelling match. And then I would start crying and then he would start Mm -hmm. crying. And it was, you know, he was very vocal about, I don't know what you're doing. This makes me uncomfortable. Um, but then after the blowout fight, after, you know, I was in a pool of tears, it was, I'm so sorry. I won't do this anymore. I'll go to therapy. Let me like, you know, send you, you know, a a gift card to go shopping, like very manipulative things where he would really tear down my heart and, and my soul and then would fix it with something financial. Um, and you know, my, my love language is, is gifts and acts of service Mm -hmm. as well as quality time. So he was using that to kind of be like, no, look how much I love you. Like let's book a vacation or let's go to dinner at somewhere fancy. Um, so it was really toxic. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying like, we'll go to therapy. We'll work through it. It's not easy, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we got married the first year of our marriage was pretty great. Like we rented a house, we nested, we took a beautiful honeymoon. Everything seemed pretty textbook, like that it was going to be wonderful. Um, We had like problems like every relationship does. Most of them surrounded career issues. Um, And now looking back on it, I can see a lot of things that were very early warning signs of narcissistic control mm-hmm. um, that I kind of brushed off at the time. Like, oh, you know, you would look really good if you got your boobs done. Yep. And I'd be like, wait, what? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm the president of the Itty Bitty Titty Committee and I love not mm-hmm. being able, like, I don't have to wear yeah. a bra. Like, shit's <laughs> fucking great over yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I, I would be like, that was weird, but then continue yeah. to disregard it. Or you should go see this specific mm-hmm. trainer. Um, Mm -hmm. and like put a lot of focus on, uh, my body and what I looked like and coming Mm -hmm. like as a recovered eating disorder, I, it was really triggering for me subconsciously. Um, and I have to imagine as your husband and your partner, he knew about that history. Oh, sure. sure. Right. It's, I, I I say that for the audience because people will be like, well, maybe he didn't know. No, these men know, they know what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there were things like that, that now, looking back on it and seeing like what his trajectory ended up being with other women. I'm like, Oh my God, he was trying to really get control of me. I was just like, not the one like that was not ever (laughs) going to happen to me. Thankfully. Um, there was another time where he was like, you know, if you want to give up acting and be a stay at home wife, I'll take care of all the bills. You don't Mm -hmm. have to work. You can do whatever you want, but if you want to keep acting, and pursuing your dreams, you have to like split rent with me and take uh-huh. care of your your own stuff, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Like it's the audacity of that. But at the time I was like, okay, well, <laughs> going to keep working. So it's fine. <laughs> I don't God. mind yeah. splitting everything. So we got married. Everything was great for the first year. Then stuff started to slowly change. We started being incredibly unhappy, fighting all the time for about six to seven months. I didn't understand why, like we were in therapy. I was doing everything we could to try and rectify our relationship and and work to get back to a place that, you know, of loving and healthy relationships. And I ended up finding out that he was having an affair for six to seven months uh, with a 19 year old. And that was the main girlfriend, but there, I mean, I uncovered, so much, you know, Snapchat yeah. porn accounts, like talking mm-hmm. to other random girls, 
um, DMing inappropriate pictures with like other coaches he worked with. Like it went on and on and on. And after the book came out, I got more messages uh, uh-huh. from other women being like, I have to apologize to you. I'm so sorry. And like yeah. went on to try and contact me. So I found out about this affair and filed for divorce and left it in my eyes, even in the moment was this is my second chance. This is like, I I had been unhappy for six to seven months. Um, Obviously like there was, that was the reason that, you know, we couldn't like rectify it and get back to a good place. But so I had been mentally checked out for, for a little while. And I want, I knew that I wanted to leave. I was just like, but we just had this big wedding and we just like had this beautiful honeymoon and all of our friends and family came and like, and my mom spent all this money to like, give me this beautiful dream wedding. Like, ha- yeah. what do you mean? I'm going to leave a year and a half in like, that didn't seem feasible. Right. Yeah. Um, and this was like my out, it was like my get out of jail free card. I thankfully, because I had been so unhappy, wasn't in love with him. I, yeah. I, yeah. I loved him. Um, but it was more of like being betrayed by your best friend and like that betrayal and rage yeah. feeling. Yeah. Um, so I, I left and I filed for divorce and that's kind of where the, the new fresh start begins. Yeah. So, you know, it's so interesting. I, my story resonates a lot with yours. And, um, one thing my therapist said to me, which really changed my narration of my own life. Cause I'm a writer also. And so I write everything in my head and as I see it, right. She said, it's not that you ignored the red flags. You saw the red flags. You just had an agenda. Mm. And I was like, oh, I love that. Right. Like my, I did have an agenda, right. For me, it was to have children and and get out of my parents' house and, you know, all these things. Right. And I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't gone through that stuff. Right. So clearly you had a bigger, the the universe had bigger plans in store for you. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, What was it like going, being a working actress and at home, things are falling apart and at work you have to go like literally put on like a happy face or act. What was that duality? Like it was interesting because sometimes things were okay on set. Um, especially towards in that six to seven month period, I did two films where, um, one was in LA and the second was on location for three weeks. And during those three weeks, it was great. A, because there were only four people in the cast, one was a female and the other two were very like non-threatening men, although Mm. that usually didn't matter to him. Um, and, but it, it was so good because he was already having his affair. So I was out (laughs) over there being like, this is great. He's finally like, yeah, the therapy's working. (laughs) No, a psych bitch. Um, (laughs) and, uh, but for the times where I would have to, you know, for one example, I did this film called Zombie Killers, and it was kind of like my first movie where I was like, it was a substantially bigger paycheck. I was like much higher on the call sheet. I was looked at as one of like the celebrity names in that film. Um, and it was a huge deal for me personally. And in my career, I was, uh, I was working opposite Misha Barton and Billy Zane. Yeah. And um, I remember it was like the best time in my career because it was such a amazing experience to be on that set and like the energy that was there. And it was also the worst time because every single night I was at home on the phone crying because of my fiance at home. It was ridiculous. Well, um, so I would be at home crying up all night and like miserable and then getting up and being happy because I got to go to set and go to work with all these people that I had like fallen in love with. Um, but it was very weird to have that juxtaposition going on. Yeah. Yeah. The two things with narcissists, right, is it's all projection, all projection. So totally. if they're saying to you, I think you're cheating, what they're saying is I'm cheating. Yeah. And then the other thing is any like success of yeah. yours or good moments yeah. of yours, they cannot handle it and they yes. have to ruin it. And I'll like, never those forget <laughs> we were sitting in therapy once and our therapist like asked him something about like, aren't you proud of her for the films that she's consistently booking and he went I mean no they're all indies it's not like she's (gasps) kissing Adam Sandler and I was like oh no so it would be okay (laughs) if I went and had a sex scene with Adam Sandler but because like the person working opposite me isn't a big name like now you're jealous what the fuck is that like that makes no fucking sense 
And and you must have known at the time that that was insane for him to say. Like that's because you you grew up in the industry. So let's talk about that yeah. for a second. Like this is not new to you. You were literally born into the industry. Your mother yeah. was a famous actress. Like so you you grew up around celebrities. You grew up on sets. So I would assume for you to hear that was like a real slap in the face. Like mm-hmm. no no oh, no, totally. this is not how we do things here. <laughs> totally, especially because. There are thousands of actors and actresses in yeah. LA that would give their left arm to be booking the stuff that I'm booking right. and yeah. would do it for free. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like insanity that he would even have that perspective. And, you know, I, I also have grown up on sets, like you said, and I know that when you do a sex scene or a kissing scene, it's like, okay, we're going to move this yeah. light. So it's shining directly at you. Can you arch your back, tilt your head? I know it feels like your neck's going to break and yeah. then like, you know, kind of smile and then do the kiss. It's like, what the actual, it's so unsexy. Yeah. Like it's yeah. the last thing. And so yeah. it was just I should have taken the red flags more seriously than I did. I just, you know, was like, let's paint them yellow and go to therapy. It's fine. The the thing is, I think (laughs) when you're a certain kind of strong, but also like empathetic and vulnerable. So I had not narcissistic abuse, but I had some fucked up shit that was said to me, right? About my body and about my career and things like that. And you're kind of like, okay, weirdo. And you walk away from it instead of being like, because it doesn't, it doesn't knock you down. So you let right. them get away with it. Cause you're like, oh yeah, you think I should go to the gym? All right. Well, I, I'm not like, okay, bye. Yeah. And instead of being like, oh my God, that's devastating. And being like, wait, they're not supposed to make me feel like that. You're just like, that guy's weird. <laughs> but I'm going yeah. to get engaged to him anyway. And so it's kind of this like really dangerous situation to be in because you are primed to be the victim of a narcissist, but you're also like a little too tough to really take in the fact that it's a red flag because you're like, totally walk away from it. Completely accurate. I will say that there are things even as strong and resilient as I am because of my, you know, what would be looked at as weak spots, like the eating disorder, for example, vulnerability there. Yeah. There were things in that, like I just posted a TikTok recently where there's a bunch of photos from when I was married. I had Mm -hmm. to like dive into the fucking archives of like my old ass iPhone. Um, and there's photos of me leading up to the wedding, um, when I was working out insanely Mm, and like, I look at them now and I'm like, I look fucking anorexic. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is not how I had the same thing. I had the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were going through all that, um, and you were, your career was on the up and up and up, who did you celebrate with? Who were your people that would like lift you up and, and be there or, you know, the first phone call for all these things, if it wasn't him. My mom uh, and my best girlfriends. I, I, it's so funny because at the height of when I was winning those awards for my film, it happened again last night, which was such a huge deal that I like yeah. wrote, directed, produced, and starred huge. in this film, and it was getting all this attention. Amazing. And I was winning like massive awards at festivals, and I would call him because he would be invited, but he would be like, "Oh, I have to work. Oh, I have <laughs> to do this." Um, yeah. And there was always an excuse. Of course, he was off fucking his girlfriend. Um, yeah. And I, I would call after, and it was like such a fake enthusiasm yeah but like I was so proud of myself that it almost didn't care that the person that was supposed to be lifting me up and celebrating me like wasn't doing Mm -hmm. a good job at that Mm -hmm. um that was also very close to the time where I found out um within like a couple months Mm. so I mean at that time I feel like I was subconsciously checked out already yeah right Right. So, so you go through this big thing. Where did the concept for Eat, Pray, FML come from? And, and, you know, where, and my other question is, were you always a writer or like, did this just come out of this? No. So I was not a writer. I mean, I could bullshit the hell out of an English essay, but like, was, <laughs> was you're not a writer. Writer. it's because you're smart, <laughs> yeah. but was not like a writer. Didn't ever go to school for it. Um, I had written the short that we had done. It happened right. again last night, but mm-hmm. like a 15 page screenplay is like definitely not a book. Um, so I left my, my marriage. I drove away from the house and was like, Oh my God, this weight has li- lifted off my shoulders yeah. and was like, fuck this. I'm going to be single for at least a year and focus on myself. And the universe was like, haha, fat chance. <laughs> um, and I ended up reconnecting with this guy, uh, named Javier and he was like the only person I had ever been casual with. Like when I say mm. we went on two dates, mm. danced at a club, made out, it was fun. And that was it. That was literally it. So when he reached out to me, I was like, 
yeah, I want to go to a club and make out with this hot Latin dude. Like, yeah. absolutely. I deserve yeah. that. Um, and was banking on it being like this casual fun fling that could yeah. kind of like, you know, just take my mind off of all the bullshit totally. that was going on in yeah. my life. Yeah. Um, that's unfortunately not what happened. <laughs> of course. Um, we, we fell head over heels in love with each other and it just went mm. from zero to 100 really quickly. Um, he was like, I have a trip to Europe booked. I don't know what to do. I was like, I'd never tell you not to go travel. And he's like, yeah. no, I want you to come with me. And I was like, you're absolutely crazy. But also, when are you going? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, um, I'm booking my ticket. Because you do, you love were... travel. You're a traveler. You're an adventurer. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, even when I married my husband, I was like, we're not talking about kids until we go to Europe for three weeks. Like, mm -hmm. that was, like, on mm -hmm. my bucket list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there were all these signs from the universe. I was like, when are you leaving? And he said September 4th, which would have been my two-year wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. said, when are you coming back? October 4th, which is my late father's birthday. So by this point, I'm like, all right, universe, I hear you. I'm going to Europe. Everything was like fucking amazing sunshine and rainbows met his family. His mom was like, oh my God, you're the daughter-in-law that like I've always oh, wanted. No. His sister was calling me sister. All of his friends were like, we've never seen him like this. Like it was like, it was so obvious that of course I had to get cheated on and get divorced. So I could end up with like my fucking soulmate, right? right? right like we're, right. we're good. And a lot of people always ask if he was a rebound and I wish he was, I was weirdly okay after my divorce like I yeah. knew of course there's like trauma that like you know the abandonment stuff that's long stemming like I, yeah. I was gonna have to work through that but like mm -hmm. I wasn't heartbroken right I wasn't sad no like, because I was you, like, you your heart was broken good. way before that like I always yeah. like I was the same way my heart yeah. was broken years before like I was mm -hmm. done yeah. Yeah. As blindsiding as it was, I was like, let's pack it up and fucking move it on. Cause mm -hmm. I know yeah. that there, this is like a better situation for me. Yeah. So the trip to Europe's booked, everything's amazing. And 48 hours before we're getting on the plane, he tells me he needs to go by himself. And mm -hmm. I was devastated that like this man broke my heart like my ex-husband yeah. never could have done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting on my bed at my mom's house because that's when you move when you're you're divorced at 28. Yep, yep, um, yeah. and I was pool of tears, bottle of wine and was like, well, I can either stay at home heartbroken or I can go travel Europe for a month by myself. And I looked over at my bag, which was fully fucking packed by the door and was like, guess you're going to Europe, bitch. And yeah. I took my backpack and I did six countries over the span of a month and wow. wrote eat, pray FML on the journey. Were you on the same flight as him? Oh yeah. We sat next to each other. Uh <laughs> 11 hours, 11 long hours. <laughs> Did he give you any explanation? Yeah. So that uh, we detail all of that in the book. It's actually okay. really, it's really tricky because I've had so much grief in my life. Like I lost my father really tragically when I was six years old, lost my high school sweetheart in a car accident when I'm I was so 18. Sorry. Like I've been through the, uh, the grief ring mm -hmm. and, um, his brother took his own life a year and a half before he and I met. Mm. and when we met it was like you know this this happened to me but I finally feel like I've like moved right. through it and I'm at peace with it and yada da, da, da. and like a week before the trip he said that he had a dream and a lot of those grief feelings resurfaced mm. and like when he fell in love with me it kind of opened the floodgates of the mm, shit yeah. he had pushed down for so long so on one hand it was like you're a fucking asshole you know what I've just been through how can you like invite me and convince me to go on this trip with you and have me be your girlfriend. And on the other hand, I was like, oh my God, I have to take care of this person because he's mm. grieving and broken. Yeah. So it was really confusing um, in my shoes because I was defending yeah. him towards my friends and family that were yeah. like coming after him with pitchforks. Yeah. Um, but I also was like absolutely devastated. So it was yeah. a lot of mixed emotions. Um, but that was, that was his reasoning at the time. So had you, had you ever done anything like that travel by yourself in that way before? I had flown to like, if I had booked a film, like I would fly by myself right. to, you know, go to location, but then you're met by all your, right. the people yeah. you're filming with and the crew and the cast. So no, I had never like traveled alone. When I was on the flight to Europe, all I knew about hostels was that there is a horror movie about them and people get brutally fucking murdered in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was like, I've seen Taken. Like, this could go really badly. I'm blonde. And I I'm love, going to I Europe. love, there's so no funny. Liam Neeson to come get you. No, right. 
<laughs> it's so funny to me because you emit this beautiful energy, right? You have this beautiful, positive energy. Yeah. And and the funny thing is, though, you narrate your life a little bit through horror movies because yeah. that's where you were. <laughs> that's that's where you're, you know, you are like a Nepo horror baby. Right? And yeah. so, you know, that's and so it's it's this like, again, this duality, but like, you know, for listeners like you know gabrielle has this beautiful light angelic like just gorgeous energy about her and oh, so to hear her you. say things like you know well i've seen the bloody people mm-hmm. get murdered all the time. <laughs> and it's like because but it's so interesting because that's what you were raised on like that's how yeah the yeah. narration of your early days the, and that the talk in your household was probably a lot about that stuff <laughs> so you you and you narrate the world through horror movies which I, is fascinating Totally. I mean, when I decided I was going to write the book, which was the day I found out I was going on the trip by myself, I was like, well, I have to write a fucking book about this. Because at that point, my life was like a weird cross between a sitcom and a horror movie. (laughs) And I was like, this has got to be something. And I knew whatever I was going to learn on this trip and the adventure I was about to have was going to be healing for me in a really big way. And therefore, if I could write it down, was going to be healing for a lot of other people as well. Um, And so I, I bought a leather bound journal the day before I left on the trip and took it with me on the, on the plane. I started the first day that I was in London and I wrote three fourths of the book in that journal. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not like I was journaling and taking notes. Like if you open it, it's chapter one and it's mm-hmm. very, very close to how the printed book came out. Mm-hmm. Um, but the whole thing was written in three months flat. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I can tell you from writing the sequel, that's wildly fast. <laughs> yeah, it is. It pours out of you. I mean, I think yeah. that it's so interesting. I I had a similar, not some different experience, but sort of similar to what you're talking about, which is when my ex sat me down, we were engaged, we were together for 10 years, engaged, living together for six, we were engaged for two. And he, we sat down and he just said to me, like, I'm not in love with you anymore. And I don't think we should have a baby mm. together. And I was Oof. like, oh, okay. I like took off my ring and you, I could see the heavens part and I right. could see the road. And like, it's that same feeling. I could see the road in front of me. And I was like, oh, my life's going to be great. Like yeah. it was so clear. And I had known for so long, I had suspected that he wasn't in love with me. And it was so nice to not feel crazy anymore. Right. Right. And, and I ended up in a situation where I reconnected with someone nine days later and I booked a ticket to go see him. He lives in Scotland two days after that. And I canceled yep. the ticket, but I we're engaged now. So it worked out. Oh my God, so I far. love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so far, so far, so good. I mean, it's great. But I knew about three days into that talking phase with, with Thomas and my fiance that that would devastate me. If he like cut me off three days mm-hmm. after we started talking, I would be so much more devastated than the end of my engagement. And yeah. so like, I don't, and people said to me like, well, he's just a rebound. And I was like, no, it's not like that. And it's such a distinctive mm-hmm. thing. Like, when you know that that thing that happens right after, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's that we're so starved for love that like we fall so hard afterwards. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if that's something that you've thought about. I think it's dependent on the situation. I have so many readers reach out to me and be like, why is it the guy after that I was with for a month that like, I want to absolutely die over and like yet my husband who I was with for five years I'm like cool Mm -hmm. bye um I think it's dependent for me personally with Javier I know now looking back on it um that there was a lot of love bombing going on Mm. I think there's two different forms of love bombing one is the narcissistic kind where someone sees an empath and they're like Mm -hmm. I am I am consciously going to love bomb this person and shower (laughs) them with love and attention Mm -hmm. and make sure that they become obsessed with me. And like, yeah, very manipulative. And then there's a second kind where it's unconscious and Mm -hmm. it's someone who has a really big void within themselves. And when they meet you, they're like, oh my God, this person's filling that void and making me feel so much better. I want more of them. I want more of them. And they start like, it's like, I love you. Let's be together. Like, this is it. This is great. Um, And then eventually- they stop feeling better because nobody can fill that void except yourself. And then they're like, oh, you're not making me feel better anymore. I'm going to peace out. And you're like, "Uh, excuse me, what? I thought we were getting married and like having a life together. Um, So for me, it was that second situation and just made it so much more difficult when you're cut off right at the height of the honeymoon phase mm-hmm. it's like oh my gosh yeah total fuck bomb <laughs> yeah and I love I mean, the it, way you put that I love that. I love that. the way you put that I think yeah. that's such a 
because I think so often now we have these buzzwords and people are like, he's love bombing you. He's love bombing you. Yeah. It's like, listen, I believe a lot of narcissists are out there and I believe there's a lot of psychopaths out there. I don't believe that everybody is doing it. I think the way you put it was no. so perfect consciously. I think some people are just doing it because they're really excited and they don't know why they're so excited. And yeah. they're doing it from, like you said, a place of void, a place of need. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. 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 Some people are just broken and think that you can fix them right. and don't realize it consciously. So you wrote the book and it's published. Did you have any idea what the outcome of this movement you started would be? <laughs> when was the you know, first time is, you realized that? <laughs> it's such a funny question because I've been answering it for two years now and I always feel like, how do I say this humbly? Um, yeah. Because I did. I knew the yeah. second I had the idea, I was yeah. like, I'm going to write a book. It's going to reach so many people and really help change their lives in different ways. And yeah. then it's going to go to the screen. Like that's in the You process. know what you're saying it to the right people. But... <laughs> we, 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 we believe the same shit about our yeah. own lives. I, I, just, yeah. I just knew. Yeah. I, yeah. Just, I was like, oh, this is what I was put on this earth to do. So I did know. Yeah. I didn't know how exactly it was going to happen or the timeline of it all. Yeah. Um, but I knew very confidently and clearly um, that it was going to be a big thing. And it's so funny because when I came back, I finished it and took it to my manager because that's all I had at the time was my manager yeah. who repped me for like acting and directing. And I was like, take this to the big five. And he was like, okay. So he took <laughs> it to the big five publishers. All of them came back and either said, it's too long. It's too racy. We would want to trim this or there's too much profanity in it. Or mm. we don't think there's a big enough audience for it, which is uh -huh. like, like you don't every understand woman the audience. everywhere. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh my and, and men, like I have a lot of male readers too. Um, yeah. and it was such a blessing in disguise because of all of those doors saying no, because that was in my mind, I was like, it has to be with one of the big five and yep. it has to be on every shelf. Like that was the only path for it. And then I was thankfully set up with, um, a woman who became my mentor named Kelly Randis. She wrote the best-selling self-published book, Spilled Milk. Yeah. And I had an hour long conversation with her and she was like, let me tell you why you should self-publish. And I was like, what? No, like this is way bigger than that. What do you mean? Yeah. Let me tell you from what I know now, if I had not self-published that book, like it changed my life financially and it would not have done that if it was with a publishing company. Yeah, we were literally just talking about this. Yeah, you're giving me chills because we can talk <laughs> about this after we finish recording, but it what you're saying reflects like- regarding books regarding like so many things that we're doing so yeah and I, and I literally just I because I was getting the show notes ready and I came in to because we're we live in the same house we're in different rooms and I <laughs> oh, came I in that. well because well, Olivia sold her house I to sold fund my the house company. to fund the company so I moved my kids and I back in my parents you go Olivia <laughs> thank you and so. I was I was I gave up my apartment to go to Scotland for five and a half months to make sure we could you know really do the thing yeah. got yes. engaged while I was there I'm waiting for my visa so I'm here and we're both oh my God, I love it. Right now. Yeah. But, you know, great. but it was funny so I was I was researching you know I knew I obviously know you and I know everything about you but I was researching you and I saw the pu it said publisher Gabrielle Stone and we all we'll talk about it a little bit with you but I literally ran into Jenny's room and I'm like oh my god she self-published the book I'm like I told you I was like I knew it <laughs> so like uh, you know so I love it and I think that I, I would love to hear about your process with that because mm -hmm. we talked to I'm a writer um I have a novel in the works I've been writing forever and we oh, nice. we have a lot of a lot of writer people that listen to us our audience is a lot of women writers because of my mm -hmm. audience love and that. I feel intuitively there's going to be a major shift towards self-publishing so mm -hmm. I'd love to hear about your process with that a little bit because it sounds like it was incredibly positive yeah um process wise it's pretty simple like you work with an editor do not skimp that step pay mm -hmm. the money like you have to do that mm -hmm. um I worked with uh Erica Ellis at Ink Deep Editing like she's phenomenal and very middle ground price wise so if you reach out to her please tell her I sent you um, hired a cover designer, worked mm -hmm. with a photographer, shot my covers, sent the photos to the cover designer creatively with her. We, we created our covers. Um, that's Murphy Ray. She does all of Colleen Hoover's books, mm -hmm, um, yeah. work, worked with a formatter who takes your word document and like 
sends back a file for your paperback and a file for your ebook. Mm -hmm. Um, you upload those onto KDP, which is Amazon's Mm -hmm. self-publishing house. Um, that way if five books get bought that day, Amazon ships five box, uh, five books out. If you sell 500, they ship 500. Right. You have no overhead except for the books that you want to have here to sell on your website signed. It's really such an easy process. And the reason why I personally loved the self-publishing journey so much, and I did my second book self-published, I'll mm. never, the only way I would ever be convinced to do a deal with a publishing company at this point in my career is if they were going to offer to translate the book into mm. other languages. Mm-hmm. I just did it for Eat, Pray, FML for Spanish. We're almost done with it. It's wildly expensive. Yeah. And I was like, I'll invest in like one other major language that I'm always asked for. Mm. But like beyond that, I would I would do a deal with a company for that because it's just massively yeah. expensive and so confusing to yeah. cause like you don't know the language and you're just like assuming people are doing it right. It's very, right. very yeah. hard for my control freak brain. But <laughs> the reason why I loved the self-publishing journey is first of all, you get to keep control. So mm-hmm. there was no one saying, okay, cool. We're going to change the cover to this and we right. don't want you on the cover or we're going to edit the book to this. Like you lose a lot of control when a publishing company comes in. I also didn't want them to sign on the book and then hold it for two years. Like mm-hmm. my soul needed to get that story yeah. out like yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you choose your own timeline for all of that. And like the biggest aspect is the money. I can tell you from doing my first audio book um, on Eat, Pray, FML with a company, because when that offer came in, I was like, I don't know anything about audiobooks. Like, yeah, do this for me and put it on all the platforms. The checks that come in from them are devastating knowing yeah. what the percentage would be if I did it on my own. Mm, right. I've done, uh, I did the second, my sequel, The Ridiculous Misadventures. I did that audiobook independently. It cost me $3,000. I made that back in the first week that it was out. Right. Mm. It's shockingly different for, yes. for Eat, Pray, FML, for full transparency. Um, one, one month I had a video go viral. So that quarter, um, did really, really well. And I remember when the company sent me the breakdown, they were like, we netted like $74,000 on your audiobook this quarter. Here's 10. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> make that make sense. Like, yeah. right. I'm sorry, what? Um, And so really like the margin of what you will make per copy sold if you're with a publisher is so minimal. It's usually like a 20% royalty compared to, you know, when I sell a copy of Eat, Pray, FML, I think I make like $6 and 34 cents. Right. Um, It's drastically different. And 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 you're able to see your analytics and track them Mm -hmm. and be like, cool, when I do this on social media, my numbers go up. Like you have so much control, so much information. Yeah. And it's like, what people don't realize is that Let's say you sign with one of the big five publishers. Awesome. Congratulations. They'll probably pay for your editor, which is great. You know, you're Mm -hmm. saving like five to six grand, depending Mm -hmm. on like the editor that you work with. And then they'll put your book in stores and that's about it. So you have to know that people need to walk into Barnes and Noble, browse all the fucking rows, get like, pay attention to your cover, want to pick it up and then decide they're going to buy it. Right. Like, they don't market for you unless you're like Chelsea Handler or one of the bachelorettes. Like they're not going and putting in money on a first time writer, like to go and market their book. So it's like, so you're telling me you want me to get a 20% royalty on the books that, that I'm selling, but I have to do all my own marketing and grind away and like grassroots that shit by myself. Like why the hell would I give you that big of a percentage if I have to do all that work anyways? Right. A hundred percent. And just for listeners, cause I know, cause I've been following your journey. Tell us a little bit about where your little old book has been because it's been around (laughs) the world. (laughs) My little old book. Yeah. It's been read in countries everywhere. Like I have readers and now listeners on the podcast that are in Africa that are all over Europe, that are in Australia. Like it's absolutely wild. And 
my biggest marketing tool has been social media. I have a mm. love hate relationship with it. Um, there's days where I'm like, I'm moving to Thailand I'm getting rid of my phone and no mm. one will ever see me again. And I'm <laughs> fine with that. Um, but when I got on TikTok in 2020, after begrudgingly being like, this is stupid and it's for kids. Yeah. And then the pandemic happened and I was like, I'm bored out of my mind. And there's really great content to scroll through on there. Um, I started posting about the book videos started going viral you could very clearly see when a video would go viral, how the sales would absolutely skyrocket, um, changed my life financially, bought, bought a house like in LA, yeah. which is unheard of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it really yeah. completely changed the game for me and yeah. social media and TikTok specifically, like when a video goes viral and is pushed to millions of people, you can't pay for marketing like that. Yeah. Like yeah. you can't pay for marketing like that. Even if it's on TV, and it's happening like during the commercial break, like people are going to be mm. getting chips and like going to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not watching that. So when no. they're scrolling on an, on an app that they're choosing to be on and actively ingesting content and they see something where they're like, oh shit, that's a wild story. I want to read that book. And then they can just close their Instagram app, open up Amazon and right. purchase mm -hmm. it. Brilliant. Like there's nothing better. And, you and you're making, you're making all of the money because right. like I follow other authors who are with publishing companies and they're like, the publishing company says that I have to do this now. And it's like, you know, it's, they might not necessarily know your audience, you know, your audience, you're yeah. tracking all the stats. And let me tell you, every publishing company is berating their authors to get on TikTok. Right. So they're basically saying, Hey, go do what Gabrielle's doing. We're just going to pay you a lot less. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like why? Don't give up your money. No. no. So where are you today? Because I know you've had some very exciting things happen in your life lately. So mm -hmm. catch us up to speed. Yeah. So people will read in the sequel, um, the the man that I am engaged to now. We're getting married in March. Mm -hmm. um, Soon. <laughs> it was not an easy road to get there. <laughs> um, it was a big roller coaster of up and downs, which which you'll read about. And, um, but I'm happy that we went through it all. We say all the time that if we didn't have the path that we had, we wouldn't be as strong and successful as we are now. Right. Um, so we are together and wildly happy. Um, we have three dogs. He has a beautiful little girl. Um, so I'm now a stepmom. Well, we call it bonus mom, but yeah, um, love it. We love and, it. And, uh, and yeah, life, life is really great. I have the two books that are out. I also came out with a, uh, self-love healing journal called fuck off. I'm healing, which is <laughs> a step-by-step step by step guide to really kind of like give you prompts and different stories that will help you dig deeper and yeah. kind of heal the different traumas that life has thrown out, uh, thrown at you, not just for heartbreak, for forgiveness and betrayal yeah. and anything that has come up throughout your life. Um, and, you know, the podcast has become an extension of that community. It's mm -hmm. been so great to have people show up every week. And it's it's really become like a safe therapy space yeah. where I drop F-bombs and, you know, <laughs> give people some really great healing advice and bring on some awesome guests that share their really powerful stories. And it's just become its own kind of like little business and yeah. community, which has been really beautiful to see that everything that I went through was so incredibly worth it. And I would do it 10 times over to be here doing what I'm doing. And what I love about your brand is that you are all about celebration. And that's what we are here at Fresh Starts. And that was something we set out from the beginning. We're like, we're not shitting on people. We're celebrating and no. we're empowering. And so yeah. like I was, you know, when you go through a divorce, as you know, surrounding yourself, even on social media, with the people that you surround yourself with, you know, there are some people on TikTok that were so anti everything, anti man, anti love, anti this, anti that. And when you come across your TikToks, it's like a breath of fresh air, right? Mm -hmm. It's like she's celebrating herself. She's celebrating mm -hmm. her journey and, and all this empowerment. And like it was just so beautiful to see a woman that went through all this stuff and was like, no, we're going to like fucking rock this world and change the world together and like, mm -hmm. you know, own it. And so I just appreciate everything you're doing. And um, for anybody that's maybe going through a divorce or a breakup or a big life change, what are some wise words of wisdom that you would impart to them? Um, I, firstly, I would say, keep your heart open, which I know is tough when you've been hurt and have gone through it. 
there was ever a time for me to close up shop and put the gate up around my heart, it would have been after I got cheated on in my marriage. Uh, And if I would have done that, I would not have fallen in love with Javier and gone on this incredible journey that helped heal myself and changed my entire career path and trajectory. So always keep your heart open. Um, It's the best thing that you can do. And when you're going through those tough moments, I would say to you that no matter how dark it is, and if you feel like you can't see any light, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I promise you it's there. Keep going because it's more magical than you will ever understand. And it's so worth it once you get there. I love that. And now the most important question we always ask our guests, what was the last (laughs) thing you ate and truly loved? Truly loved. Um, you know, I, today for dinner, before I got on with you guys, which was such an early dinner, I was like, I'm like a grandma <laughs> at this point. It was like 5 PM. Um, I had linguine and clams oh, in best. white sauce. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I haven't had it in so long, like probably over a year, if not more. And my mom had it when she ate it all the time when she was pregnant with me. And she would always joke that whatever she was eating when she was pregnant with me, I ate when I was a toddler. So like, you know, all the, all of my friends would be like, I want chicken nuggets. I want McDonald's. And she'd be like, Gabrielle, what do you want? And say, I, would, I want wingweenie and quams. Mom. <laughs> um, so it's like one of those like sense memory foods. Mm-hmm. Um, and for some reason I was like hankering for it tonight. And I ordered that in a chopped salad and it was divine. That sounds amazing. amazing. Well, that does sound amazing. <laughs> so good. I love that you're pursuing joy through food because that's what we're all about here. Yes. Um, that's well, like <laughs> most of my joy in life is food. Well, oh, we understand. You're we in understand. good company then. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Um, well, thank you for sharing your story. And we're going to obviously link to everything in mm-hmm. our show notes and our blog posts so everybody can go and read your books. I was definitely inspired, you know, by everything you're doing. And you were just such a light in the world. Yeah. And what I love is that it's rare to come across a woman who just owns the fact that she's going to change the world. And oh, that's, you. I, you know, we're like that. And it's, we, it's, <laughs> we it's rare to come across other women that are like, no, I'm fucking changing the world. Get out of my way. Mm-hmm. And like, yes. you know, and so I love, like, you know, we always say it's like these women are in our coven, like, and we just, we're, we're just so thrilled that we got a chance to talk to you and share yeah. your story. So thank you for taking the time out. Cause I know you're oh incredibly busy. You're so welcome. And thank you for having me in the coven. It's a great spot to be. (laughs) Thank you for listening to today's story. We're always here and we're proud of you. Until next time, brave one. A fresh story is brought to you by Fresh Starts Registry, the first and only platform for everything you need to start again. You can read the show notes and learn more about today's episode at freshstartsregistry.com slash podcast.